Uh, Mr. Kessler, if you call your board. I'd like to call this Planning Commission meeting for Bedford County to order. Thank you. I'd like to welcome everyone to the meeting tonight. Um, just a couple of rules of decorum. If you could turn your cell phones off or on to vibrate. Um, if you could also remove your hat, if you're gentlemen. And then um, we will begin this with a moment of silence. Thank you. If we could stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. All right. Um, everyone should have a copy of our agenda for this evening. Are there any questions? If not, look for a motion for adoption. So moved. Second. We have a motion by Mr. Johnson, seconded by Ms. Bansley. All those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. This brings us to our citizen comment period time. Our time, we've got three public hearings tonight. Um, so the citizen comment time at this point is for any topic not related to those three public hearings. So if it's short-term rentals, boarding house, or halfway house, those, those comments will be saved for those portions during the agenda. So you'll have three minutes, as you'll see a clock over there. It will begin as soon as you complete your name and your voting district or address, whichever you'd like to use. Then that three minute goes, it will beat, and that is the end of your time. So I need you to adhere to that. I will stop you at the three minute mark. So I don't have anybody that has signed up specifically for the citizen comment period time, but if you would like to speak, if you just raise your hand, I'd be glad to call you forward. All right, don't see anyone for that, so we'll close that citizen comment time. That will move us into our joint public hearings with the Planning Commission this evening. The first one that's up is consideration of an ordinance amending short-term rental in the Bedford County Zoning Ordinance, which is Ordinance 0081423-01. And we'll hear from Jordan Mitchell on that. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We'll give a brief presentation tonight over the short-term rental ordinance changes uh, for you all. So just kind of want to go over the current ordinance issue. So as we've been talking about with the Planning Commission as well as you, uh, it's just an ordinance that's very difficult for one force. The, the key component of that ordinance is the overnight occupancy limitation. And as we've talked about, it's really just the bed checks going and checking these homes late at night to see if they're complying with the over-occupancy. And the other issue with but, our current ordinance. I'm, I'm sorry, but that light on that is blaring right yes. in my eyes. Thank you. Sorry. And the other issue with the current ordinance is, of course, uh, as we mentioned, as uh, compliance with the Code of Virginia. You know, Code of Virginia requires a yearly registry. Our ordinance has a permit that is good indefinitely. Um, if he's provided for a realtor's exemption. Um, Code of Virginia says you have to have more than three violations. Uh -huh. Our court ordinance says three or more violations. At the third level, we could revoke a permit. And of course, it also sets a maximum of $500 penalty for the failure to register. So I want to kind of go over our current ordinance and the fine structure within it. There's two sections of the ordinance. There's section 30-22-1, which is criminal penalties, and section 30-22-2, which is civil penalties. Under the criminal penalties ordinance, a uh, fine of $10 to $1,000 is a, is a possibility of a penalty that we can levy. Uh, once we go to court with that penalty, failure to remove or abate the violation within a court specified time, another fine of ten to $1,000. And of course, for every 10-day period that violation has not been removed after the court specified time is an additional $100 to $1,500 fine. Of course, the other section of the ordinance is civil penalties. The initial summons for that is a $25 to $200 fine. 
Any additional summons after that is a fifty to five hundred dollar fine. So, kind of what's changed in this new proposed ordinance? So, new proposed ordinance is compliant with the Code of Virginia. As I mentioned earlier, those items that we have that list of non-compliance were already in this code. There will be a new definition for short-term rental and operator, and these op these uh, definitions were taken straight from the Code of Virginia. There will be a registration that is yearly. The zoning permit issuance will confirm that registration. There will be a $500 penalty for failure to register short-term rental. Overnight occupancy restrictions are replaced by a management plan and restrictions on advertisement. And kind of, we'll go into some details with those here in the next couple slides. Uh, parking of vehicles must be on the rental property. As I mentioned earlier, permit revocation possible after more than three violations. And we also give notice in this ordinance that we will do an inspection if the, there is a violation or complaint, depending upon the type of complaint or violation is requested. To kind of go into the proposed changes, the key elements of this ordinance, the enforcement, you know, require a management plan for all operators. The management plan will include the repeated number of guests, along with parking information, dwelling floor plan, local points of contact, respond to complaints, an advertisement plan, garbage disposal, and any additional information requested to ensure ordinance compliance. I want to be very clear, all short-term rental operators will have to submit a management plan to us for approval. Even the realtors that are managing the properties, they are typically the operator and they will have to submit this to us. Properties served by private sewage disposal systems will follow the system design, two persons per bedroom from the Virginia Department of Health permit. So of course, advertisement or rental, this is a new addition to the ordinance as well. This will kind of coincide with the management plan. The advertisement of the short-term rental will need to comply with the issue permit, the registration approval, or any other provision of the short-term rental restrictions, and this includes the management plan. Okay, so the advertisement that we approve of needs to be basically the same as the management plan. So our, if our advertisement says the home's gonna sleep or have a total occupancy of six people, we expect the advertisement to stay the same. Do you have any questions I can answer from a planning perspective? Yes. When they submit an application this year, do they have to pay anything? Uh, right now, uh, new application fees are fifty dollars, and the same will be for the new for the people that are required to register. So every year they have to pay fifty dollars. Uh, yes, correct. Yes. I have a question, for Mr. Mitchell. Uh, with regard to the um, with regard to the realtors, will also have to comply with the uh, management plan. Yeah, they're they're How concerned are they about going to be known if it's, they're not registered per the state law. I'm sorry, say that again. How will you know who has who's managing or operating a rental home if they're not required to register per the state law? We would have to reach out to the homeowner. So let's say we get a violation for uh, this property that is uh, does not have a short-term rental permit in our system. We would reach out to them with an inquiry letter asking them are they operating a short-term rental based on the evidence we have. Um, they could tell us at that point in time that we are that our property is being managed by a realtor. And at that point in time, we would ask them to give us a management plan. Okay, so not until there's a violation would they be required to file this management plan? Uh, no, we would be requiring all, that is the key. That will be a violation of the ordinance if they don't do that. So that would be, we would fine them for that. Even though they're not required by the state law to register? They're re the operators are all required to submit management plans to us. All, they don't have to register the, on the registry but they have to give us a management plan. They have to comply with the rest of the ordinance sections. The only thing they're exempt from in the Code of Virginia is the registry. Okay. <clears throat> yes. Is the management plan a yearly submittal as well when yep. they renew the, their permit? They will have to update that every year, correct? Yes. Every year we would be looking at the reports <coughs> or rentals to tell us one, are they still using the same management company? I mean, they could change. So we would look at that yearly. They could also change within the year cycle and maybe require to register at that point in time as well. So yes, is everything will be on a yearly basis. And is the yearly cycle our cycle or is it the? It's the Code of Virginia, the registry cycle is a yearly cycle. Yes. <coughs> how did you come up with $50? $50 will be the charged. Application? Yeah, how'd you come up with that number? That's what we charge for every zoning permit that we issue for the registration. So keep in mind, the, the, the management plans and so forth, we don't have a fee structure for that. So that will be something we'll just have in the office that we're reviewing and approving of without charging a fee. Yes. 
you you mentioned that they were limited to uh, two per um, approved bedroom capacity based on sewer or if they're on a I, uh, based on their septic system um, do we have properties that are on sewer that would also fall under Sure. And then what type of limitation do they have with respect to occupancy? We still have the ability to take a look at, even though we don't have an occupancy limit set for those, we can still look at the amount of bedrooms they have in the home and how they are, how they are managing their home and have an overall approval of that. So, for instance, we would kind of still look into that two-person two per bedroom kind of deal unless there's some other scenario for that. So do we have provision for that in, in absent, um, you know, if they're on sewer instead of septic? There is no necessarily provision of how many of the occupants can be in there when it's on sewer. That's correct. It's it's going to be just us reviewing their management plan and seeing if it coincides with, um, you know, our the home that's there, the amount of bedrooms in the home, from the certificate of occupancy in our office. There's no health department involvement there. But we can determine what that number yes. is. Yes. Okay. Yeah, and that number, if they don't like the number we give them, that's an appealable action they can send to the board of zoning appeals. Any other questions for staff? I don't see any. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. All right, thank you. <coughs> okay, that will move us into the citizen comment portion of this. Um, so just as a reminder, you can, if you've signed up to speak tonight and you have not spoken on this subject in the last 90 days at another Planning Commission meeting or Board of Supervisors meeting, you'll be able to speak tonight. I do have one person that has signed up that did speak at our last meeting on this topic. Um, you will have three minutes. You cannot um, give your time to someone else. You have three minutes to speak. Um, and we also have already received many written statements that have already been written, um, entered into the record. So I will start our um, public comment time now. And the first person I had signed up is Ebra Hoffbeck. Good evening. I'm Deborah Hoffbeck. My address is 210 Driftwood Court in Moneta. Uh, first of all, I want to thank the Planning Commission and the County Commissioners for um, addressing short term rentals because in my neighborhood we have had lots of problems with them. Um, in particular, my biggest concern is actually maximum occupancy. And I know that you've gone through several different iterations on how you want to state that in the ordinance, but I'm a little bit concerned about the way that it's come about that the latest revision on that is. Um, because if you're on a septic tank system, um, I'm still a little bit con concerned about how the occupancy is determined for those. Because for example, in my neighborhood, we have two new houses recently built by the same owner exact same floor plan, exact same installation. The one has uh, been registered as a five bedroom, the other is a six bedroom. Um, but that five bedroom house, they're advertising that they can have 16 people there. Their actual occupancy is 20 and they have eight cars going in and out, in and out, all day, all night. And the other one, uh, for some reason, has been approved as a six bedroom. They're uh, advertising 20 people there. Um, and also, kind of in relation to that, since you're not, not going to be requiring any kind of septic tank pump out for these um, septic tanks, it's like, how do you know they're not going to be overflowing? So I know that that was one thing that was taken out of the ordinance revisions that I, I would really like to see put back in there to have some kind of requirement on the pump outs. Um, the other concern I have is about houses that are on county public sewer. Um, this same owner is building eight more identical houses, which have building permits saying that they're five bedroom houses, yet they're already advertising that they're going to be seven bedroom houses with 18 plus people. The other one that they're building um, is already advertised at nine bedrooms of 22 plus people, and there's eight of these that are all going to be right next to each other on the public sewer system. And so I'm really concerned, um, do we really want somebody running out to 22 plus people with eight houses right next to each other. Um, so I'm hoping that you'll reconsider about 
the houses that are on the septic, uh, on the <coughs> public sewer systems having something in the ordinance that actually specifies um, what their maximum occupancy can be. And um, again, the same thing on the houses that are on the septic systems, um, septic tanks. I do hope that um, we, that it can be enforceable to um, not exceed what the septic system allows or the max of two, bedroom, two people per bedroom. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Hoffman. Just in time. That's how you do it, folks. <laughs> Next up is Carrie Sarvey, and following her would be um, Brindley Cook. Good evening. I am Carrie Sarvey, and I am a resident in District 1. I am the author of What Are the Gains and Have You Ever Considered that I have sent to both boards over the past few weeks. Although both letters posed several questions, there was only one response to acknowledge receipt. But I do understand that you have been inundated with the wants and desires and suggestions from many other letters, emails, phone calls, and other um, things that are being suggested. But that's exactly why we're all here tonight and why there should be such an emphasis put on the thought and consideration on this ordinance, how it is written and how importantly, and more importantly, how it's going to be enforced. This has been a hot topic for many years now and many of us have come to every meeting, sent emails, letters, and asked for you to hear us as residents in Bedford County. We are the residents in Bedford County. We are the families, the working class, and the stable, sustainable future for our county. We are not here to make a quick buck or to turn something out. We are not here to exploit the environment or the economy or the legal or civil systems in Bedford County. We are here to raise our children, to grow businesses, to protect our properties, and to provide for our community. We choose to buy houses and live in residential neighborhoods zoned for R1 and R2, only to only be increasingly overcome with soliciting cesspools of short-term renters, rental properties sprouting out everywhere around us, Many that are not legal, not registered, and many that do not operate with sound business practices. And yes, they are businesses. Operating businesses that solicit services on an open and unfiltered market, pulling in whoever will pay the rent for the houses next door for three days, five days, or a week. As a mother and a homeowner and a community member, I never know who's going to be living next door to me for days at a time. I never know my neighbors because the neighbors on all three sides of me are short-term rental properties. Of the four of us back in my cove, three are short-term rentals. I'm the only one that's not. I've had to call law enforcement many times and DGIF. I'm not proud of that. I do not want to do that. When I grew up, you only made these calls in true emergencies. But in Bedford County, we're told that that's the way we handle these situations. In Bedford County, we're told that's the way that they get violations and the way that it's known that there are issues with the property. We're constantly in worry and on alert. People we don't know or don't invite come onto our properties. People come pounding onto our front doors. We don't know them. We don't invite them. Sometimes it's because they're high or they're drunk, or sometimes they're just plain lost because the GPS system brought them to our driveway instead of the one next door. We don't know these people. We don't invite these people. Sometimes people we don't know and don't invite drive their boats without voter licenses from businesses on the, the, the lake to crash into the shoreline. Thank you, Ms. Sarvey. Ms. Cook, and then she'll be followed by Rhonda Tyler. My name is Brindley Cook, and I live at 129 Charmwood Circle in Manita. These problems do not even highlight one of the worst of, of the worst problems: the overcrowding in these short-term rental properties. It is the overcrowding that leads to the most of the problems: the noise, the partying, the drinking, the trespassing, the showing off tendencies that cause accidents and property damage. The most awful problem is not not often seen: problems with overtaxed septic drain fields. A drain field can overflow for years and create a, an environmental problems without being s deemed a septic failure. We need strict enforcement 
of numbers allowed by septic permits. If the septic is for six people, then six people is the number allowed to rent. Strict, enfor excuse me, strict enforcement of county building codes. I'm seeing short-term rental properties that convert garages and storage area areas into bedrooms and stack bunkhouses in them. We need strict enforcement on properties to obtain the permit. Strict enforcement of penalties on those who violate the ordinance. Strict enforcement that, oh, sorry. Strict enforcement of violations against properties that advertise and or rent to more than the allowed number of occupants. And a stricter approach to properties that continually violate the ordinances. When a property has been reported or for violations more than three times pull that permit. Short-term rentals is a privilege, it is a privilege, not a right. Renters leave Bedford County. We, the people here tonight, the residents, we stay. We are the future of the county and the stable. S sustainability citizen, 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 excuse me, citizen, citizenry. <laughs> That is what the county is really built on. Hear us, please. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Cook. And next up is Rhonda Tyler, and she will be followed by Walt Reichard. Good evening. My name is Rhonda Tyler. I am also a citizen of Bedford County. I'm also an owner and operator of Rock Creek LLC here in Bedford. My husband and I moved here eight years ago, and for the past year, uh, five of those years, we've been planning and constructing two short-term rental cabins in the rural part of the county near the Peaks of Otter as part of our future retirement plan. I was a teacher here for the first four years that I moved here, and in 2019, I retired to run our cabins. Our cabins are located on our nine and a half acre property where we also live. So we are able to, very, to be very hands-on host and monitor our guests closely to make sure quiet hours, number of guests, parking, et cetera, are all being complied with. Our guests have 24-7 access to us, which I feel is a really great thing. Uh, it's a great thing for us, for them, and for our neighbors that, are, that surround us. Um, a, benefit, a benefit for all of us um, whose privacy we value greatly and we want to protect. We've had zero issues between our guests and surrounding neighbors in the four years we've been operating. I know the lake area has a different situation due to the many tourists that visit that area each year, going there for a different reason than they come to us. They come to us to get a quiet weekend away, away from D.C., and they just want to be left alone. They're not there to party, so I know it's an entirely different situation. I certainly empathize with the residents of Smith Mountain Lake and their issues with short-term rentals there. I appreciate the board's efforts to plan and implement policies that benefit both sides of this issue and protect the rights of all involved. There are pros and cons to short-term rentals, but I believe there's a great value in sharing our beautiful area with others, providing unique lodging to draw them here, generate revenue for our county, and follow uh, and our fellow small businesses and small business owners, which we refer our guests to consistently here and at the lake to support them and help the entire county to flourish. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Tyler. Next up is Walt Reichard, followed by Tracy Reichard. I don't, know, I don't know how you keep a Liberty University professor down to three minutes. I can't teach a class in an hour and 15. I'm Walt Reichert. I live at 1119 Carnes Road, Bedford, Virginia. We've been here since 1999, and we love Bedford County. I was asked to come here um, this evening on behalf of our neighbors and friends, the, the Tylers, who live across the street from us. And I really do sympathize with what I've already heard from the folks from Smith Mountain Lake. And, and what those folks are dealing with. Ours is a different story. In the four years that the Tylers had their, have had their Airbnb, we have had absolutely no complaints, no disruption to our lifestyle, no adverse effects, no calls to the police, no people wandering at our doorstep. We've had absolutely none of that. So it has absolutely not affected our lifestyle one bit. And we've <coughs> even gotten to meet some of the folks who've stayed at the Tylers Airbnbs 
developed some new friendships, met some nice folks. So again, it's a completely different situation than uh, what we're hearing that's going on at Smith Mountain Lake. So again, I just came here tonight to just give another side of what uh, we're occurring and maybe there should be two sets of standards on Airbnbs for what folks are dealing with in one part of the county as to what they're dealing with in the other. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Riker. <coughs> Up after Tracy is Enric Groff. Good evening, I'm Tracy Reichard. I also live at 1119 Carnes Road, uh, and we are at the Peaks of Otter. So we know about septic fields and drain fields. We've got one big enough to put a small hotel on in front of our house. But that being <coughs> said, the Airbnbs, when you have a proprietor on the property, tends to have a huge effect on the results of the renters. So what we're hearing from the residents of Smith Mountain Lake is that these are all retail properties. They're built by someone and developed and then handed off to someone else to manage. It truly is a totally separate scenario. Um, the drain fields are a problem, obviously. But is that the bigger problem? How can we group a small proprietor that has a two or four uh, person limit to a person that has a 20, they're renting to 20 or 22 people. I don't believe that this um, ordinance is a one size fits all type of ordinance. You just cannot compare the smaller business with the mega renters out there. Thank you. Thank you, Trace. And after, after he is uh, Steve Pitcher. Uh, hello, my name is Heinrich Graf. I'm uh, 1288 Casey's Lakeview Drive. So we have actually a speaker that is our main speaker. So I'm, I'm just supporting him here. Um, for those, we, I, I agree with all the people that talked before. I mean, uh, we're all on the same page, kind of. Uh, this. The, the, those septic tanks that are over overused, they should probably get at least a, a time frame that they have to be emptied out again regularly, more regularly than probably regular people that live there if they are if they have a, a, a over occupancy. Um, and then, um, and then what I uh, what I liked too was that management plan so that when police comes to that place that they can see what the occupancy number is because it's, it may be very difficult for them otherwise to figure out so I I, 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 I like your presentation too it's, it's down our, our, our alley and then I wanted to say I have I, I recently built there so and I have three bedroom two bathrooms and we get an occupancy permit for seven so and uh, if then I can hardly imagine that they have the same, in the same area, there's one house that maybe is a little bit bigger, has more bedrooms, but there can be 20 people. And I can, can hardly, uh, hardly see how they park, how they, how they will get around there. Uh, so I don't know, that's for me business and not, that's probably a gray area between uh, uh, a little business for residents and really business people that come in in an area uh, where there's a residential area and just build a business up there and, and make as much profit as possible out of what's already there. Uh, yeah, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you, Mr. Groh. Up is Steve Pitcher and then Mrs. Pitcher will follow. Good evening. Uh, I'm Steve Pitcher, and my wife and I live at 1490 Casey's Lakeview Drive. I've been here several times, as you know, to try and discuss our concerns. Um, I spent 20 years in the military. My teams were one of the first in the Baghdad International Airport. We hunted down war criminals in Serbia. And we supported the first truly free elections in northern Iraq. So I'm used to fighting for fairness and against injustice and never giving up. Um, 
I sent an email late last night. I hope you all received it. I think it's a fairly reasoned, logical middle ground, something that, that we should all be able to support. But I'm having, you know, but, uh, you know, and I have to believe that all of us, you know, wants the best for Bedford County and that this amendment should be intended to define a short term rental policy that is simple to implement, simple to enforce, encourages operators to self enforce, reduces the likelihood of large obnoxious gatherings, which we get and reduces neighbors frustrations and the need for them to report non-compliance and increases fines to support staffing enforcement and reduces the need to investigate non-compliance. Unfortunately, the, the currently proposed wording will not do that and will continue to frustrate neighbors, the Planning Commission, the Board of Supervisors, and the people in Jordan Mitchell's office and Sheriff's office attempting to enforce it. I know Jordan was up here and was speaking about how, you know, how this is, you know, how it, all these things are, all these good things. Unfortunately, that's not the wording that's in there. There's confusion that's in there and there's ways that we can write craft it so that it reduces that confusion and will help us to do, uh, to enforce it better. Uh, <laughs> We've got to get the max, we've got to figure out how to define that maximum occupancy. And we have, I have gone and taken photos morning at seven, before 7 a.m., after 8 p.m. at night, every night, showing the nine, to, you know, the, the, the four to nine cars in the driveway of that one developer that you've heard so much about today, <coughs> Mike Beville. He's ruining the lake. I mean, you look at the, all of the houses, all of the, all of the examples that have been used tonight have been his houses over, over occupancy, a house with an eight person, um, uh, eight person septic tank, 29 people. The, the new houses, they're gonna be on, on sewage, but they're you know, on state and city, city uh, county water and sewer. But the problem there is the first two houses are already be almost done, not almost done, they've started, and they're planning to, uh, planning to, uh, to rent at uh, seven bedrooms for 18, nine bedrooms for 22. This is in an R2 residential area. If you count up how many that would be, you're talking about 50 cars in that neighborhood, which is a small cul-de-sac. Where are those cars going to go? You've taken out the, the, the requirement for all cars to be inside, on the, you know, inside the driveway. You're allowing them to be anywhere on the road. Okay, that's one piece that needs to be added back in there. Cars must be on the property. To be, with, with 50 cars out there, it's clearly a rental. Okay, so. Thank you, Mr. Pitcher. Three minutes is not enough, but you've got it. I would like to make sure that what I sent last night is in the record because it does provide with good recommendations. Thank you. Ms. Pitcher, you're up next. That will be followed by Paul Stroth. Paula Pitcher, 1490 Casey Lakeview Drive. I know you guys have seen us plenty of times. So first of all, I'd like to thank those of you who, who have already spoken, and they made a good point. There are two different areas of this county. When you're renting short term on you know, peaks of water, it is totally different than what we're experiencing on the lake. That should be considered because our neighborhood, we are on the lake. We have been approached <coughs> just in the last two months buy short-term rental agencies to buy our home. This is our home that we live in every day because they want our property because of money. This is what, this is our home. We are not 25, 35, we can't just pack up and move. This is our home that we are retiring in. We are being approached by short-term rental agencies wanting to buy our home. They have went through every home in our neighborhood doing the same thing. So, um, those of you who are short-term rental people, this is what's happened in our neighborhood recently. Not only have we had one house that rented for 27 people, that's a four bedroom house, clearly over occupancy. The other house on the other side of us, we've had 15 people in a four bedroom house. They had partying, there were teenagers passed out on the lawn. They, were, they approached our dog who was deaf and tried to scare her. Um, there were little kids on the property. These things are happening. In addition, the same house renting for 15, 20 people, and there's trash cans. There is trash, it's overflowing the trash and it's going down on our streets. And these, these things have got to stop. What you guys, you guys who are renting that don't have issues, think about what we are experiencing. We had <coughs> one arrest. In, there was an altercation. We don't know the terms of it. It was recorded. 
people were arrested. This is happening next door to us. And I would like to have one more thing to say. Our neighbor who couldn't be here tonight, she is a county planner in a rural area. She frequently gets people who are buying homes in the property where she is a county planner. And this is what she recently said. And you can contact her for validity of this. Um, a, a person was talking about the process. She was wanting, wanting to buy a million plus dollar home. And she was asking questions. She's a very informed land, land owner and had done her research on the area in which they had purchased property. The conversation quickly turned into natural areas and short term rentals. And this is what she said. We have done a lot of research about where to buy property. We looked at many areas within the DC area, outside the DC area. We actually tried to find a place on Smith Mountain Lake for a long time, but there's apparently some reluctance on at least one side of the lake to, to regulate short-term rentals. We definitely don't want to build our dream, dream home in an area where there is at risk of neighbors going, where our neighbors are going to be running hotels. We rented several places and really liked Bedford's side of the lake, but we could tell there were rentals around us and we just don't want that. They're going to destroy everything that makes them desirable. This is the reputation Bedford County is given. So two things to consider. The choices you make on this matter have long-term implications on the type and quality of future growth. One of the primary purposes of planning zoning is to protect the health, safety, and well-being of citizens. Again, we know that short-term rentals are here. Have you considered getting a working team of the short-term rentals, you guys, and the citizens? There, sorry, there can be a way to everybody work together. It's called working teams, and it's just something to think about. Appreciate your time. Thank you. Mr. Schroth. Uh, <clears throat> I'm Paul Schroth. I uh, live just over the county line in Campbell County. Um, been living there 16 years from uh, upstate New York. Retired early out of the auto industry. Uh, love the central Virginia area. Have enjoyed Bedford County for recreation. And uh, my wife and I had a plan in our retirement to uh, buy a property here in Bedford. And we thought about Smith Mountain Lake, but uh, we thought it was a little too busy down there. So we found a property in the northern part of the county, and we can identify with the Reicherts who spoke. We found a cabin on 18 wooded acres. Wheats Valley Road, just north of the reservoir. And so it's a nice country setting where you don't have a chance to bother your neighbors, and you're lucky if you meet your neighbors, and they've all been friendly. Uh, our impressions of Bedford County have always been good up until uh, this is really a little bit off the issue. Uh, when we went to purchase the property, uh, we were told by our lawyer that there's a, like a three-month bottleneck in the health department to, uh, because it was a divided property, we had to do the septic, go through all the approvals and everything. So even though it was an existing Airbnb, we were buying a business, so to speak. We didn't want to operate it as 100% business. We wanted it 50% for family and ourselves for recreation, enjoy the property. And the other 50%, yeah, we can make some money when it's vacant. Uh, and meet some new people, uh, be part of the, uh, the uh, tourism industry of this county. I think a lot of people like to come to this county and spend their money. And we've met some really nice people. So we've only had this property for six months. But uh, I would just caution you, like they said, the Rikers, uh, you know, one size fits all, not really. You're always going to disappoint somebody. And I know you can't customize it to each individual case. They have legitimate concerns that we're hearing tonight, but how do you go about doing that? So I'm just praying that you guys will have some wisdom in this matter, and I thank you for your time. Thank you. It was rough. That was the last eligible um, sign up that I had for this public hearing. Is there, I've got a little time. Is there anyone else that um, didn't sign up that wanted to speak on the topic? Hi, 
Hi, my name's Jessica Kosman. Um, I live at 250 Pine Knob. Um, so I do have a short-term rental. Um, so one of, I guess, my concerns is that I have a three-bedroom, two-bath house, 2,500 square feet that we bought last year that, according to the 40-plus-year-old septic permit, is only permitted for a two-bedroom house. So I am limited to four guests, according to these rules. So I can't even rent to my own, my own self. So I have three kids, because I'm being told that your bylaws are kids two and older, are considered an adult. So three kids and two parents, I can't rent to. So when I called the health department to question, because when I get my septic pump out, I'm being told that I have a thousand gallon pump out, which according to the septic <coughs> experts say that's a three bedroom like septic system. I'm asking if there's anything I can do to see if there's another inspection or something like that to see if we can see if there's a discrepancy from 40 years ago. And I'm being told that they couldn't even possibly theorize how to do that. So I feel like I'm not trying to do these 15, 20 plus people rentals, but I feel like a three bedroom house that I can't even rent to my own self, like a, fa like a single family, heaven forbid I had a grandparent in there, like I couldn't even rent to that. I think that's getting a little stringent. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you. All right. That'll, that'll conclude the citizen comment portion of this public hearing. Now we would um, have time for any questions, discussion from the Planning Commission or the Board. Mr. Chairman? Yes. I, I think they have to deal with it first, and, yep. then, and then when they're done, then we deal with yep. it. Is that correct? That's correct. Yep. Okay. But we can have joint discussion, correct? I've, just, I've got one comment, and I've talked with Mr. Mitchell about it. Um, on the ordinance um, concerning the management plan, um, it says that the advertisement has to conform to the management plan, um, but there's nothing that says the management plan has to be approved. It doesn't say that. So. I would just like to make a recommendation that at the end of the first sentence on item two in the proposed ordinance that we add the words for approval so the management plan is approved. Um, I know it sounds nitpicky, but somebody could walk through that door and say, you don't have to approve it. I gave you one. It means nothing. So. Other, other than that, We've worked, we've worked on this ordinance for a very long time. It's, unfortunately, it's never going to be perfect. It's just the way it is. Um, do I think it solves all the problems or addresses all of them? No, it, I don't. But um, we, we need to have an ordinance so that we have some ability to do enforcements and call this the first step, but it's definitely the step in the right direction. And that's it. I have a clarification for Mr. Mitchell. I just want to make sure because we've heard that the vehicles were not in the ordinance, but in line six, it specifically says all vehicles, boats and trailers of tenants shall be parked on the lot on which the dwelling place dwelling unit is located that covers the concern we heard this evening so there's two sentences in that paragraph there's the last sentence that says that all boats and trailers have to be parked off the road um contract basically the ordinance has never stated uh that vehicles have never been in that section of the ordinance so we added vehicles to the first part that they have to be parked on the property Technically, if that's the case, unless your private street goes to the center line of that road, they really can't park in the street. But this, that's not the property. The second sentence doesn't include cars. It just says boats and trailers. Right. Can we add the word cars? Okay. I would just. My, my thought was the intent when we talked about that first part, that, that's what that meant. Yeah. Here's what I would tell you. The management plan is supposed to show us where people are supposed to park, um, requiring that management plan to have them park on the property. You shouldn't see many parked on the road, but you know, that would still be a violation of the management plan, either without you adding it, but you can add it. I, if you want to reiterate and hammer that home. I, I personally thought the intent was to be that way. 
Mr. Betches. So can we just keep the word in? Can we add the word cars just to be clear? Vehicles. People will argue with you if you fail to include that. I have to agree with Mr. Sharp. Yeah, I just think for clarification, just if we keep that word in there. And, and I like the, the verbiage approved management plan. Well, you're adding it. It's never, it's not in the ordinance now. I understand. Yeah. So let's add it. Okay. Is that a consensus? I just think it's cleaner. Yeah. Just add it to the second sentence also. Yeah. yeah. The first sentence, add yeah. it to the second sentence. Yeah. Right. While you're, you're here, can I talk about the signage again? I know we've discussed that a lot. I haven't seen the word non-illuminated before. So I know when you're on a dark road and you're going up to the peaks of Otter and you're looking for a cabin in the woods and, and they have, and I've seen them going up there, there's a sign, it says there's a cabin here and I don't know how they're gonna find it otherwise. Okay. Uh, Non-illuminated signs have always, that has been the, what we've had in the ordinance for. Can we just say limited to one sign? Because there are situations where they have to be a, a light on it or no one's gonna see it. Maybe an advertisement would, issue more than anything else. Would but. that include digital signs as well? No, I would just say a sign that has a light on it. Would, would that be an illuminated sign or no? No. A sign, Illum so as long as it has a sign with a line on it, it's not. You can shine a light on the sign if you want. The illuminated sign would be a sign that's literally illuminated internally. Internally. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. As long as we have, they have that. Okay. I'm feeling a little uncomfortable though because aren't they supposed to be doing all their work and then we are supposed to do our yeah, and then we can tweak it yeah so we should probably keep our mouth shut <laughs> what a challenge i have a question for mr mitchell i'm going back to the registration because it is clear as mud it says here in the second paragraph of section one registration is not required by persons who are licensed real estate board by a real estate board or is properly property owned property owner who is represented by a real estate licensee mm -hmm. if they're not required to be registered how are they again going to be filling out a management plan which is in the section two because we're requiring them to do it so section one is moot Section one is an exemption for the literal registry itself. Patrick Megan back so me up with this. But so the registration is separate from the management plan. Yeah. Okay. Unless you are registering and then therefore you are submitting a management plan with that. If you are not registering and you're not required to register per that code, you're submitting a management plan to me for review and approval. All right. Well, the code of Virginia, this whole section is talking about the county's uh, ability to register or create a registry of uh, short-term rentals so does the county have additional powers over this we're not creating a registry with that we are asking them to submit a management plan to us for all operators for us to approve of the registry itself is just official short-term rental registry that's all it is okay so it's a separate issue separate issue very good. They, to give you a for instance, you know, this year they tried to come back to the General Assembly and try to exempt themselves from all local government regulation. So it's very clear that that's, the registry is all they're exempt from because they now, they also are fighting to get exempt from all local regulation. So okay. until that happens, we will be looking for a management plan from all operators. And on the email you had sent out requiring local point of contact for short-term rentals, where is that in the actual uh, it's in the management plan requirements management plan. okay well I just want to say that I don't necessarily think we need a local point of contact for all short-term rentals um, people can manage from pretty much anywhere and the local point I, I'm not quite sure what the reasoning behind that is the local point of contact it should just be a point of contact well whoever owns it is responsible for it should be able to be contacted at whatever time 24 7. so i don't necessarily like the word local point of contact in there maybe just point of contact <clears throat> and that's all i've got currently
No, it's you I was guys got to be quiet. <laughs> you guys have to do it all. Good deal. All right, I'll take the floor then. Any further discussion, Marcus? My butt. Any further discussion, monks, planning commissioners, or any further questions for Mr. Mitchell? <clears throat> Hearing none, I'll ask for a motion. All right, I'll make a motion. <clears throat> I make a motion that we adopt text amendment application TA 23-0001 with a few modifications to um, the instead of local point of contact just remove the word local wherever that appears section 2 second sentence correct and then on section 6 add vehicles to the second sentence so it's boats trailers and vehicles or vehicles boats and trailers however that is worded by the uh, mr mitchell's office and the addition on the first sentence of number two for the approval of the management plan and the approval of management plan as discussed all right we have a motion with the three noted changes. Is there a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve TA 23-0001 with the changes on item two and also item six as noted. Any further discussion? Hearing none, I'll do a roll call vote. Mr. Gwynn? Yes. Mr. Burdett? Yes. Mr. Moisa? Yes. Mr. Ray? Yes. Mr. Briscoe? Yes. Chair votes yes. Okay, that tosses it to our board. What discussion do we have <coughs> regarding that um, recommendation from the Planning Commission with those amendments? I'd like a little explanation on the point of contact. I couldn't hear everything. Um, I believe what I was understanding was it would not be necessary for a local point of contact, but just a point of contact. Would not be It would or would you not? You would have to have a point of contact, but not local. necessarily local. local. Okay. Someone a local. Just someone that could be called in the event. Isn't that kind of what we got now? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Mr. Chair, I, I would agree with the recommendation from the Planning Commission with the exception of removing the word local. I think it does need to be a local person. I think that's part of the problem. That's part of the problem. Well, I guess you need to explain what local means. Do you have any suggestions on what that means? <clears throat> Someone in Bedford County would be how we would term that. I, I think from our perspective, the, the one of the biggest issues we've always had with the complaints are is we have an out-of-town um, person who's operating the short-term rental. They can be very slow to react to the changes. If there's a local point of contact, the real idea behind that was is that we can have we can contact someone locally. They can go out there and deal with the matter immediately if there's a complaint, unruly guest, those kind of things. Um, not everyone manages these properties appropriately. I think you've heard a lot of the folks tonight kind of say that. You're gonna have a wide range of folks that live next to short-term rentals that are have good experiences and some very bad experiences and. Usually it really revolves around the, uh, the unruly guests. So the local point of contact is to try to deal with the unruly guests that are there to get them off the property as fast as possible if the sheriff's office is not able to do that. So. Are you, one, are you assuming that the sheriff's department has less power than a local point of contact to remove somebody from a property? 
Well, I, I think what we're talking about here, it would be just depending upon what the violation would be, of course. So um, they would go and determine whether or not they want to do that or not. I couldn't, I don't want to speak for the sheriff's office, but I know there's been times they've gone down to properties and they have not done much of anything. Um, there could be various reasons for that though. So I think the whole point here is, is when they go down there, we want to be able to have someone, you know, let's say, uh, I'll use an example. Let's say I get a phone call from a, a citizen who says that they're, you know, the people last night were unruly. They're all still there right now. Um, they're over occupancy, the, the dwelling unit based on the, on the, we can call that local point of contact who may come in and say, well, hey, you aren't complying with what we rented the property for, get off. Um, that's just really the whole point. Mr. Can, Sir, that can be done from a distance. It doesn't have to be done locally. But they can't see it for themselves from a distance. Mr. Sure. I would have to defer to Mr. Mitchell on this. He seems convinced that we need a local point of contact. And I could certainly understand and empathize with his reasoning behind this. And the other thing is, is as we were, Tommy and I were kids, Mickey, we grew up, you know, one bad apple spoils the whole bunch. So there's been several cases that we're all been made aware of and, and why we're here this evening in this hearing. And to me, it makes sense. The local point of contact needs to be there. And, and the, if these folks want to enjoy the, the income from the short-term rental properties, which there appears to be abundant income to be made, that's great. But at the same time, they've got to be responsible. And this has come to this as a result of some bad apples. So I certainly support a local point of contact. I, I can understand Mr. Moise's uh, reasoning in this, but at the same time, it's come to a point where we need to have responsibility in these. And those folks who are doing a good job managing and bringing in high caliber tenants, they have nothing to be concerned about. On the other hand, the folks that, that aren't managing it well, I know for myself, I would soon learn, I got to do something better and I'm going to start paying closer attention to this. So, so I have to agree with the local point of contact. Mr. Chairman, I, I just envision a situation where if the point of contact's in, in New Jersey and, and we're trying to get in touch with somebody in New Jersey, I, I don't know the sense of urgency translates over distance like it does if he's across town or at the lake or in Manita or somewhere local. I, I think that um, there's probably businesses out there that you can hire to be the point of contact that would that would monitor not they wouldn't be the management's companies but they they could be a point of contact that would go out and pass the uh, pass the message along to clean your act up or get out I wholeheartedly support local contact <clears throat> mr. Chair. yes the only problem I have with the local part is you have Roanoke and Lynchburg they were all your realtors and everything concentrated. So if they were renting the property, they live in Lynchburg, and that's the local point of contact. And it's a problem. You know, say, well, you can't be because you're in Lynchburg. Roanoke is probably closer than most parts of Bedford County. Can we say a 50 mile radius? Huh? Can we say a 50 mile radius? That's why radius? I'm thinking maybe we could do a radius, you know, and include. Roanoke and Lynchburg and Ala Vista and play. I mean, it's still local, but you're not telling Lynchburg you can't do it because you're not in Bedford County when they're a, a, con a highly concentrated realty company it's there in Roanoke. Yeah, I can go along with that. I'm okay with that. I don't know how you want. Yes, you have a suggestion on no, the word there? What I was going to say is over the last few years, there's just been a a little bit of an exodus of the local real estate companies managing short-term rentals. Um, the manage, managing the properties from afar have always been the problem. I think Mr. Bevel was mentioned tonight. Um, you know, that's one of our frequent flyer complaints that we do get for his properties, and they can be slow to react to some of the issues that these folks are having. Um, if they're local, you know, I can you know name Lake Retreat properties, for instance, locally. Rarely, if ever, get a complaint for one of their properties. So. Clearly, there is some value in the local aspect of having a local real estate agency. If you're going to have someone manage it, that's your best bet, and that's the way you get the least amount of complaints. So. Uh, we have a consensus on, I don't know how you want to call it, but it would be our local area. Central Virginia. 
I think more important, <laughs> Mr. Chair, than local, and I, I'm not opposed to it, even though I have a Airbnb in Florida, and I'm certainly not local to Florida, and I, I don't have any problems. I think the problem is that they're not responding. That's the part of the ordinance, local point of contract available to respond immediately to complaints. So they might be local, but not respond. I think the point we have to focus on is whoever it is has to respond immediately, whether there be local or not. And I think there can be a response that's done immediately. I certainly respond to anything I get from Florida immediately. Sounds like Supervisor um, Bainsley has some experience being a uh, local contact. <laughs> well, and Mr. Chair, certainly my tag in there is Mrs. Bansley, Bansley said, uh, in, in this day of uh, high-tech gadgetry, uh, I'm sure that we need to attach to this ordinance some some means of expecting to be able to get to somebody in the event of an issue without having to wait for a long time I mean, an immediate contact I'm not opposed to either one to be honest but would we be insane to say an approved contact <laughs> <laughs> so that section of the ordinance also has a caveat in there that we can ask for things that if they're problematic you know so clearly if you wanted to just go with a point of contact that can respond immediately that may be seen to that person who's registering that management plan that that's a person that's local okay um, and of course obviously if there's a slow amount of reaction to the complaints we get for that when we do the next management plan for them we can ask them specifically due to these issues we would like to have someone local within a certain radius before we approve of that plan and that's probably would be your you know a good way to be able to handle that but the last sentence that we have with the management plan where we can also request additional information if we feel that it is needed to approve of the plan that would be kind of that caveat you know if we have a problem property you know it's from afar we could always ask for that the next cycle mr chair yes. i think it you know this this whole thing certainly carries with it the knowledge that I have to call people frequently in, in, a, in a part of the business that I do. And nothing is more frustrating than people saying, oh, I didn't answer the phone because I didn't know who it was. So then you gotta text them. And, and I think that it needs to be very, very plain English that if, if we're gonna have a point of contact, whether local or not, that they need to be responsive immediately to a call from Bedford County in the event of a complaint. Because again, um, I know we all know this, but I'm gonna remind us again, you know, we are here to serve the interests of our residents, our taxpayers in this county. And we're not here to be punitive to people, but you know, there's a reason we are here in this discussion this evening. So I think you really need to have some teeth in being able to get a hold of someone. And, I, and I'm, I'm in favor of a local point of contact. Mr. Chair, I think we're all pretty much on the same page here. I don't hear any opposition on the Board of Supervisors. Are we ready for a motion? Uh, I'm not. Okay. All right. Uh, item it's a section or part two B item nine. It says upon more than three violations of any applicable state or local laws, ordinances or regulations as related to a specified property offer for short-term rental, um, the county may prohibit such property from being registered and are offered as short-term rental for a period determined by the zoning administrator that shall not exceed two years. Uh, I, personally, I, I'd like that to be will, will, not may. Um, I, I think that makes it are more like, oh, I'd better straighten up my act. It's subjective to the to Jordan. Yeah, it otherwise. basically takes the pressure off of you, to be honest, because then it says, hey, look, my hands are tied. It's not my fault that you've continued to violate these things. I'm okay with that. 
I'm okay with that based off what we're managing with this with this regulations in the ordinance. Uh, if we were doing the overnight occupancy uh, limitation and the property owner you know is doing everything they can and they're they're renting to the right amount of people, they're advertising it correctly, and then there's folks showing up on the property that um, you know are in excess of that without them knowing, it'd be a little hard pressed for me to say that I would revoke the permit. But however, here in this situation where we are literally looking at, hey, does the ad match what the management plan says? Yes. And if they're com if if they are responsive and they are saying, look, you gotta, you know, some people gotta get out, you know, that type of thing. Yes, I agree. Yeah. But if they're not doing what they're supposed to do, uh, and they're bad actors, I don't and, disagree with that. I think that's a good change. And I would like for that. Uh, just want clarification on this and that's it says the property from being registered because i don't want um a manage you know a, an owner to say well i'm just going to change it to another llc that they manage right and then come back and register it i mean t to get around it right i don't so it needs to stay with the property so at this point if they want to sell it Somebody can't buy it and then use it as a rental. Right. Uh, that, 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 um, that offense carries with that property for the two years. It may be better for you to change that to a, to make sure that nothing gets missed with that. I would just say that once you get it revoked, it's not valid for two years is what I would do. That way it's very clear. If you sell it, there's no funny business. There's no, hunting down for us to figure out who the owners are. are they Are they related? Are they the same person? I would recommend that if you do that, just say flat out, it will not be able to be registered for two years. That's the way I would prefer. Yep. So just to be clear, three times within your year, a guest parks on the street. More than. More than three times, a guest parks on the street. Like he reads over the, you know, you we've sent him the regulations, but you know, Aunt Louise comes and she parks on the street. So, so first, that's one, that's a violation. No. So what we would do in the first time that happened when their management plan or their advertisement said that they, maybe they could park on the street or didn't specifically say that there's no parking on the street, we would specifically tell them, hey, in order to correct this issue on the first time, to make sure this doesn't happen again, make sure your, your, or your advertisement states no parking on the street. That covers them. Yeah, their contract needs to be no parking on the yes. street. And then if there's somebody parking on the street, they need to be responsive, get out there and get them, off. get them off the street. Correct. And as long as that's the case, I don't think that's a violation. That's not a violation. That would not be at that point in time. That's correct. That is just simple someone doing something they should not be doing. That's not on the operator is what I'm trying to say. This is, this is to punish the bad actor. I think they need yeah. to go out and break Aunt Louise's knees. <laughs> <laughs> I have some heartburn with, in the event of a sale or transfer of the property, to someone not affiliated with the current owners. I have some real heartburn about prohibiting how they're going to use that property. Okay. Well, here's here's my. I mean, I'm okay if you tie it. I mean, it's not hard to figure out who owns an LLC. Here's my here's my problem if the the bad actor there's a financial penalty to that bad actor if they can't sell it for rental purposes uh for you know for two years i mean it, it just it puts more teeth in this ordinance so that i'm not going to be a bad actor right i mean so it, I think it needs to stay with the property because in the end, otherwise, look, I, I can't rent it. I'm just going to sell it for top dollar and somebody else is going to then turn around and rent it. Correct. And, you know, the, the problem is you, could, you can have somebody in another state that's, you know, that's a friend or a relative and, I mean, it, it, they could be all kinds of funny business. So if it stays with the property, there can be no funny business. Right. Exactly. I think that's why you're better off if you want it to truly make sure there's no funny business going on or we miss something in our office. That's the best way to do it. There's going to be houses sold 
where the buyer thinks they're buying a Airbnb or, or a short-term rental, and they don't know it's been, what's going to happen then. I would assume at that point in time, they will be going after the realtor or the property owner at that point in time. <laughs> and and we can certainly record something <coughs> in the land records. I mean, all it takes is a one-pager saying this property has been pr prohibited from short-term rentals for X um, amount of time. It should attach to deed or something. I think that's a good point. That, that yeah. Any bona fide purchaser should be on notice of what they're getting. Sort of like a lien. Mm -hmm. Not a bad idea. Yeah. I was also thinking we could have some kind of database where we could throw a, a sheet of paper out there online, an Excel spreadsheet or something of that nature, properties that cannot be registered for short-term rental and just throw it out there. Addresses, everything, or PC number. Well, you're talking about someone we'll show up on a list tonight. four violations and is headed to revoke. I'm thinking about, suppose you bought this property as a short-term rental and you had two violations against it and you didn't know about it. It's just... Mm -hmm. Bed, or if you got, especially yeah. if you got three, and you get yeah. one, and you get shut down. Well, that yeah. would be two violations. You buy the property, and you get one violation, you shut down for two years. Yeah. Well, the <laughs> operator would change at that point in time, though, so that would reset well, that. He's number. saying if it's on, if it's on the house, yeah, not the operator, it. then it wouldn't matter. Well, that's if it got to the more than three. So I just don't think it's fair to well, stay with the property. If it had three on there, and he sold the property, somebody else comes in and buys the property, gets one, they're gone for two years. That's right. That's not. No, I think we no, talk. No, I think no. we're talking a point that might happen once in. In years, and we're trying to figure out every little. Well, it's a, but it's a lot like what you all were doing early on the others. I mean, I, I know it's probably not likely to happen, but have it buttoned up to so if it does happen that it's. I think as I think as long as it's it's occurred, then the financial penalty will go to the bad actor right. because they won't be able to sell it for a rental property. And that's going to be a pretty big hit. So if they got two, that might be a way to run those bad actors out of town because they'll go, look, I don't, I don't, I don't want to take the chance of getting a third. Let me just sell this property. And they'll sell it to somebody. And then that way they don't get burdened with the two. They, get, they start over again because it hasn't been, um, it, you know, it hasn't been under them. It hasn't been penalized, right. and then theoretically they're going to be a better better actor. I mean, the, the whole idea is to just get rid of the, the bad actors right. and run them out of Bedford County. So I, I think keeping it with the property is a pretty darn good financial penalty for any bad actors. I mean, they might, as soon as they hear that we've done that, they might start selling now, and I'm fine with that. I mean, I'll be honest with you. Last week, we we sent a, we had a phone conversation with one of our uh, folks that's a frequent flyer, and you know, basically reiterated, "Hey, you're at this point where I'm going to seriously consider consider revoking your permit based on the actions there or the complaints I'm getting." Probably literally went up for sale in the following few days. So, yeah. well, the other thing too is there's got to be a clear understanding, knowing in advance what the penalties are, so the folks, again, hopefully, it'd be preventive instead of punitive. I have a question. <clears throat> what about you? You said frequent flyers more than once this evening, Mr. Mitchell. Should we consider something for folks who are multiple SRT owners or STR owners? Sorry about that. As far as you know, having multiple violations in the same period of time. I think you're referring to the the penalty. You wanted to set a higher penalty for that. Well, I'm, I'm just saying it, it's, it's probably something that we ought to consider because we, we're aware of, of another developer that, that we've had to deal with some in this county or, you know, well, why don't we head this off before we give it a chance to begin or while we're talking about this? So there's a range with the civil penalties and the criminal penalties and the ordinance. We would at that point in time be going to the very high end of that range. I mean, we're not going to actually put the hatchet on this thing tonight and it's going to be done. I assume you're going to go back and work on this a little bit more. Is that right? Yeah, there's some, there's uh, a few sections. Done. Yeah, I mean, there's a few sections that wouldn't be effective right away, but, um, but yeah. Yeah, I think it'll be done tonight. We're never going to ready to make a motion. <laughs> yeah. But I think it's important to realize that this is a first step. This is not a one and done, that we see what we fix and then what's not fixed. And then we tweak the things that aren't working 
10, 12 months down the road. I mean, I, I've been listening to this stuff for six years I've been on this board. <laughs> Y'all just getting a good dose of it in the last six months. I think it's time for a motion, Mr. Chairman. Um, but it, this goes so far from what we had, and, I, and it answers so many of the concerns, and I know it doesn't answer all the concerns that people have, but if this can clean up 75 to 80 percent of the issues we've had, that we've made a lot of progress. And then a lot of the people I talk to, it's, it is the same group of property owners, so it is the it's a few property owners that are making it rough on the rest of them. Right. You can get them flying straight on this. It's going to take care of a whole lot of the problems. Mr. So, Chair, yeah. if I may interrupt, there, there was one other thing that, that I think is worth mentioning, and I, I don't believe I've heard it mentioned, and I don't want to drag this thing out, but what about the overflowing trash barrels um, that's been mentioned? Is, is there trash pickup at the lake? I don't know. And, and, you know, but when these, I mean, it's absolutely rude and disgusting to have these overflowing trash barrels that's been mentioned. And has any, is anything in, I haven't seen anything in this amendment about garbage being strewn throughout the streets from too much. And in light of the fact that we've got a county landfill problem that is, is terribly costly. I would think that would be covered in their management plan yeah management plan requires them to to show the location where the refuse area is and of course if there's a lot of trash on the on the i guess on the property can, can we specifically state make sure that the trash is well kept or something clear language uh so there's no complaints from the neighbors you know if we have an unlawful accumulation of waste ordinance that we do enforce so i mean if we have the evidence to you know, show someone take a picture of six garbage cans overflow in the yard. We can do something about that, and that goes into the one of the three violations of local law. All right. Uh, Neighbors aren't particularly shy about sending us pictures of trash. Yeah, no, they're <laughs> not. <laughs> Chair, before I make a motion, um, as proposed with the amendment, local contact staying intact, um, property is being penalized or assess the penalty, not the person or the LLC. What was it? There one more. And the permit shall be revoked, not may. I think was one of the yeah, suggestions. Will, will shall be. Yeah, what will be revoked, not may. Will be revoked. Mr. Chair. Yes. If there's no more. Well, before you make a motion, so it won't have to be amended. Your motion on local contact. 50 mile radius is okay. what I is, is what I was going to propose. Is that what I, is that what I understood the consensus? I think it's fine. Therefore, Mr. Chairman, for no more discussion, I'd like to move that we approve ordinance 0081423-01 with the Stipulation added that we keep a local contact within a 50 mile radius of the property, that any assessments that are levied go on whoever the property is owned by at that time, uh, if not to the person but to the property, and change it from shall be revoked after, after three it would be the fourth violation to will be revoked. And Mr. Johnson, I think there was also the addition of the vehicle. Mission recommendation. Okay. All right, that, that was done as it was sent to us. Okay. Okay. So these are the only three changes we're making from what they sent. Okay. Okay. That's the motion. We have a motion for Mr. Johnson. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Davis. Any other further clarification? Point of clarification that the pro that the violation goes with the property and not the property owner. Correct. Is that your motion? Yes. Any other discussion? Be a roll call vote. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Bansley? Yes. Mr. Sharp? Yes. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Ms. Parker? Yes. Chair votes yes. Mr. Chair, did, did we get a second? Yes. 
Yeah. Okay. Mr. Davis. I'm sitting right next to you. <laughs> okay. That moves us on to the next um, the next public hearing, which is a consideration of an ordinance amending the halfway house in Bedford County Zoning Ordinance, which is Ordinance 081423-02. Mr. Mitchell, back on to you. Mr. Chairman, I don't have a uh, very elaborate presentation for this one. This is a fairly simple uh, zoning ordinance text amendment. Before you tonight is a text amendment to, uh, to not list halfway house as a special use permit in the AV zoning district. So it's a very straightforward um, application for a text amendment here tonight. If you have any questions, happy to answer from, from a planning perspective for you. Anything for staff? We'll toss that down to the Planning Commission. Yeah. I was going to let y'all call the next one. <laughs> All right, we're going to open the public hearing. I don't have anyone that's signed up to speak on this particular topic. Janet or Tracy, if you'd like to share any of your heart about this, <laughs> now's your time. <laughs> Does anyone like to speak on this proposed ordinance? If not, we'll close the public hearing and I'll pass it down to the Planning Commission. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You, Mr. Chairman. All right, before us, we have the text amendment application TA 23-0002. Any discussion or questions for Mr. Mitchell regarding the text amendment? Hearing no discussion, I will ask for a motion. I make a motion that we adopt TA 23-0002, halfway house zoning ordinance uh, amendment as written to the Board of Supervisors. We have a motion, do I have a second? Second. We have a motion and a second to approve text amendment <coughs> application TA 23-0002 as presented. Any further discussion? Hearing and seeing none, I will do a roll call vote. Mr. Gwynn. Yes. Mr. Burdett. Yes. Mr. Moisa. Yes. Mr. Ray. Yes. Mr. Briscoe? Yes. Chair votes yes. Mr. Chairman? Right. Back that to comes you, to our board. Is there any discussion on this text amendment ordinance? There isn't. I would entertain a motion. Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion, and I'm not sure if I'm supposed to be doing the TA or the. Okay, now it's ordinance. Um, Ordinance 081423-23. Make a motion to approve. Dash 02. 02. 02. Sorry. All right. We have a motion by Ms. Parker. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Scott. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Ms. Parker. Yes. Chair votes yes. That passes. That moves us on to the Last public hearing, which is consideration of an ordinance amending boarding house and guidance services in the Bedford County Zoning, Ordin Zoning Ordinance, which is Ordinance 081423-03. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, as you mentioned, this is a text amendment to uh, amend the definition of boarding house as a single family detached dwelling unit or part thereof in which lodging with or without meals is provided by the owner who resides on the premise to three or more, but not less but not, excuse me, but less than nine boarders for 30 consecutive days or longer included in this use type are rooming houses and tourist houses. And number two, that be amend to list guidance services as a permissible use after approval of a special use permit in the Agricultural Village Center Zoning District. Currently, guidance services is listed as a by right use in that particular zoning district, so. 
Let me know if you have any questions. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. I'll send it to the Planning Commission. Mm -hmm. Public, Public here. <laughs> I don't see anybody jumping up. All right, I'm going to open this public hearing to anybody that'd like to speak about that. All right. Yes. Obviously, no one wants to speak about that. So we'll close the public hearing and now the zoning. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Planning Commissioners, before us is Text Amendment Application TA 23-0003. Any discussion? Hearing none, I will ask for a motion. I make the motion that we adopt or recommend to the Board of Supervisors text amendment TA 23-0003 as written. Do I have a second? Second. Any further discussion? Hearing none. This vote will be to approve the or deny the text amendment application TA 23-0003 as presented. I will do a roll call vote. Mr. Gwynn. Yes. Mr. Burdett. Yes. Mr. Moisa. Yes. Mr. Ray. Yes. Mr. Briscoe. Yes. Chair votes yes. Mr. Chairman. Thank you. All right. Any questions or discussion from our board on this proposed ordinance? As I understand it, it'll be special use permit required in the AV zone, but it is by right in C1, C2, PCD, and PIV. I believe that's right. It's not changing in the others. It's only changing in the special use. Okay. Any other questions? Did entertain a motion? Mr. Chair, I'll make a motion to approve ordinance O O O zero eight one four two three dash zero three. Have a motion by Ms. Parker. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Scott. This is a roll call vote. Mr. Davis? Yes. Mr. Scott? Yes. Mr. Johnson? Yes. Ms. Bansley? Yes. Mr. Sharp? Yes. Ms. Parker? Yes. Chair votes yes. That motion passes. Mr. Kessler, you may adjourn your committee, and we, with our great thanks. Thank you, Mr. Chair. <laughs> Do I have a motion by the Planning Commission to adjourn our meeting? Motion to adjourn. We have a motion, a second. second. All those in favor, say aye. 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 Motion Thank carries. You. We will give you a few minutes, and we will convene up on our agenda. On task here. Next up on our agenda is the consent agenda. Mr. Hiss, would you share with us? Sure. 
We only had a, one item on the consent agenda this evening, and it is a, a grant application being submitted by Fire and Rescue for the submission, acceptance, and appropriation of a state homeland security program. Okay. Primarily for hazardous hazmat um, equipment. Any questions concerning the consent agenda? Uh, I'm ask for a motion. Motion. Have a motion for Mr. Scott to approve the consent agenda. Is there a second? Second. Second by Mr. Sharp. This is a roll call. Mr. Davis. Yes. Mr. Scott. Yes. Mr. Johnson. Yes. Ms. Bansley. Yes. Mr. Sharp. Yes. Ms. Barker. Yes. Chair votes yes. Motion passes. We have nothing on our action and discussion items for this evening. Next up, we have the approval of the minutes. Um, we have set from April 24th and May 8th. Any questions or corrections regarding the minutes? Make a motion to approve the minutes. Mr. Scott makes motion to approve. Is there a second? Second. Second by Ms. Parker. All in favor signify by saying aye. 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 All opposed? Motion passes. No board committees reporting. Uh, board comments? Anything anybody needs to share with us tonight? Mr. Hiss, is there anything you need to share with us tonight? Um, the, the only thing you may have seen on social media, um, our public information officer, Shelley Basinger, has put out a survey out into the community to uh, gauge and receive input about how citizens want to receive information from the county government. So there's a short survey about different uh, tools and methodologies and what's effective, what's not effective, how would how would citizens like to receive information from us? Just to uh, part, part of it's just a gauge to see if we're if we're uh, providing it effectively, and if the feedback shows that there's different things we can do, we can uh, adjust accordingly over time in order to meet uh, what we think we hear from the citizens in order to receive information. So I think that's a good good survey that's out there in the community, and encourage people to fill it out and provide feedback. Mr. Chair, yes. I'd like to point out that um, we have a Holly has been nominated as Citizen of the Year for Bedford County, and also another uh, nominee got nominated. It's in the audience here this evening, uh, John Barnhart. And I'd like to wish both of y'all good luck. <laughs> both deserving. That moves. Can't get it. That's. That moves us down to board appointments. Um, we do have, I have an appointment to fill my um, recreation advisory board for district two. So I would like to make a motion to appoint Kaylee Martin to fill that um, unexpired term. Second. Do I have a motion by myself? <laughs> Second. <laughs> Seconded by Mr. Scott. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Uh, All opposed, same sign. Motion passes. Mr. Scali. And Mr. Chair, you uh, brought up, I think in the last meeting or two, about amending our elderly tax relief code. Um, I believe we've been in discussions with Ms. Patterson and uh, Ms. Anderson and have come up with um, some increases to those, those limits, and that's based both on our own financial position and what our neighboring localities are um, doing in that regard. So if it's the consensus of the board, we'll tee that up for uh, public hearing and an ordinance. Is that something we're going to discuss before we do that or we can I, I think the limits we had talked about were forty five thousand dollars as far as income and one hundred and fifty thousand dollars for assets as far as the caps One hundred and fifty beyond the house or does that include the house mm -hmm. okay yeah because if it included the house then yeah, you know, we'll get what are we doing yeah I, a consensus from the board to go ahead and move that topic to public hearing. Yes, sir. Thank you. All right. We will do so. Thank you. All right. Mr. Stauder, you got anything to share back there? No, sir. All right. 
Our next meeting is August the 28th. We've got a work session at 5 and a regular meeting at 7. I'd like to make a motion to adjourn. <laughs> oh, oh, wait a minute. He hadn't asked, he hadn't asked Robert. He did. Huh? Yeah, he did. <laughs> I didn't hear it. I have a motion by Mr. Sharp to adjourn. Is there a second? Second. second. I'm not going to second it. <laughs> <laughs> All in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. All opposed? We are adjourned. Aye. <laughs>